Welcome to Christian Visual Arts News Desk. My name is Dwayne Johnson. In our first segment today, the question is, how would you weigh your awareness of knowledge against your awareness of ignorance? Between 470 and 399 BC, during the time of the King Artaxerxes of Persia, and Nehemiah the prophet, there was a Greek philosopher by the name of Socrates who has been quoted as saying, One's wisdom is limited to an awareness of one's own ignorance. Ever asked the question, How aware am I of my ignorance? And what is my level of wisdom? The decisions you make in life will be based either on knowledge or ignorance. When your attitude is, I know it all, it shows your limited wisdom and your lack of awareness of your ignorance. According to Buckminster Fuller, who created the knowledge doubling curve, he noticed that until 1900, human knowledge doubled approximately every century. By the end of World War II, knowledge was doubling every 25 years. Today, the average human knowledge is doubling every 13 months and is expected to increase even faster due to the World Wide Web of the Internet. Some estimate that in the near future it will double every year due to the computer technology. It would appear that the turning point was during the 1945-1948 time frame, about the time that Israel became a nation. Israel had not been a nation for some 2,500 years. We read in the Bible in Daniel 12, verse 4, that in the future, travel and education shall be vastly increased. It is estimated that the book of Daniel was written around 600 BC, over 2,000 years ago, some 200 years before Socrates. In the past 40 years, we have seen computer technology advance to a point where cash transfer between companies is done by computer. According to IBM, the build-out of the Internet of Things will lead to the doubling of knowledge every 12 hours. As we gain knowledge, we realize that the more we learn, the less we know. So let me ask you again, what is your level of awareness of your ignorance? 2,000 years after the Greek philosopher Socrates, there came on the scene a French philosopher in 1596 through 1650 by the name of René Descartes. He is known as the father of modern Western philosophy. Philosophy, at its simplest, is the study of knowledge, or thinking about thinking. Descartes made the statement, I think, therefore I am. In this statement, he was declaring his awareness of self. In a broad sense, philosophy is an activity people undertake when they seek to understand fundamental truths about themselves and the world in which they live and their relationship to the world and to each other. He lived during the same period as Galileo. The people during this period of time thought that the sun revolved around the earth. They were not aware of their ignorance. In fact, they said Galileo was out of his mind when he said that the earth revolved around the sun and they placed him under house arrest. Today, some 500 years after Descartes, 
and Galileo, we think we are so brilliant and smart. Yet, are we any smarter than past generations? Yes, I believe so. But what about the people thinking about us 2,000 years from now? Will they say we were ignorant as well? Question. When did the light bulb of awareness regarding your ignorance come on in your life? Now we know history records that there have been many brilliant debaters about this world's great affairs. Yet in 1 Corinthians 1 verses 20 and 21 we read, So what about these wise men, these scholars, these brilliant debaters of this world's great affairs? God has made them all look foolish and showed their wisdom to be useless nonsense. For God in his wisdom saw to it that the world would never find God through human brilliance. And then he stepped in and saved all those who believed his message, which the world calls foolish and silly. Question. Who is God? Your answer will reveal either your knowledge or ignorance. Your answer will also determine your success or failure according to the Bible. In searching for answers, we find that the Bible gives the correct answer to who God is. In Genesis, the first book, the first chapter, and the first verse, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And in the last book in the Bible, we read in Revelation, the fourth chapter and the eleventh verse. It says, You're worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. So, why is it that the brilliant debaters of this world's great affairs say, there is no God? That the world just happened from a big bang when nothing exploded. Today's theoretical physicists and astronomers tell us that nothing is the dark matter that cannot be seen. Dark matter is an as yet undetectable form of matter that is invisible, but which is thought to make up about 80% of the universe. That it is high energy, randomly moving particles created soon after the Big Bang. Let's see if I understand what they said. They said it cannot be seen, as yet undetected, and it makes up 80% of the universe that we live in, and it was created. Well, at least they got the created part right. It sounds like the nothing that exploded, causing the Big Bang. Yet on wikipedia.org, there is a picture of nothing. Oh, I mean dark matter. A picture of as yet undetected matter. Okay, well, it's your decision to accept or reject the hypothesis of the dark matter and who God is. May I remind you what Psalm 14, 1 says? The fool says in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. Their deeds are vile. There is no one who does good. 
And in Romans 1, verse 19, we read, For the truth about God is known to them instinctively, and God has put this knowledge in their hearts. Twenty-six verses later, in Romans 1, verse 25, we read, They exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. Amen. We started out this segment asking the question, how would you weigh your awareness of knowledge against your awareness of ignorance of who God is? In our next segment, we'll look at gaining knowledge and wisdom. Ever asked the question, why are some people smarter or have more intelligence than others? Does it correspond with why some people are taller or shorter than others? Some say it is genetics. You get it from the DNA that is passed down through the generations. Take King Solomon for an example. They say that he was the smartest man who ever lived. Why? Was it passed down from King David? Or was it because God gave him the ability? In Romans 9, verse 21, the question is asked, Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? Answer, yes. God is the creator of all things. Therefore, God gives different levels of ability to people. We saw in 1 Corinthians 20 that it is not human brilliance that finds God. It says, would never find God through human brilliance. And then he stepped in and saved all those who believe his message which the world calls foolish and silly. Do you know what that message is? Would you know where to look for the answers? The answer can be found in the Bible, God's notebook on life. 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 tells us, the whole Bible was given to us by inspiration from God, and it is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It straightens us out and helps us to do what is right. In Genesis, we find that God first created the heavens and the earth and all the animals. In Genesis 2.7, he created man, and in Genesis 2.17, he gave man a command not to eat the fruit. And in Genesis 3.6, we find man violated that command, causing death to enter the world because of Adam's sin. The next 38 books of the Old Testament tells us about the history of man's nature. Then in Matthew 2, we find God's plan to send Jesus to earth. And in Matthew 26 through 28, we read about Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. The following 25 books of the New Testament tells us about Jesus' teaching and how Christians are to live. The last book, that of Revelation, tells of the judgment and what is to come. Revelation 20 and 21 talks about a white throne judgment and a lake of fire and a new earth. This is the message that the world great minds call foolish and silly. Why is that? Well, in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, 
we're reminded of why some people think it is foolish and silly and fail to accept the good news. It says, Satan, who is the god of this evil world, has made him blind, unable to see the glorious light of the gospel that is shining upon him, or to understand the amazing message we preach about the glory of Christ, who is God. Satan blinds mankind in several ways. Because of mankind's sinful nature, he draws them to run after money, to seek power or pleasure. In this way, it makes God's good news appear to be of no value. This desire for money, power, and pleasure is set into motion by one's sinful nature. In physics, Newton's first law of motion states, an object at rest stays at rest and an object in motion stays in motion with the same speed and in the same direction unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. The object is free from any force. Man's free will in life was set in motion at birth and continues in the same direction until an unbalanced force is applied. The question is, what is the direction of man's will? Man was born with a sinful nature. Therefore, man's will is to continue in the sinful direction. In John 6, verses 44 and 45, we're told about a change in direction in a person's life. Jesus was speaking and he said, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him to me, and at the last day I will cause all such to rise again from the dead. As it is written in the scriptures, they shall all be taught of God. And those the Father speaks to who learn the truth from him will be attracted to me. The word draws and attracted would indicate a force being applied to change directions. The direction of mankind continues on the wide downward path until God the Father draws one to Jesus. This drawing is by applying God's grace. God's grace is the greater force that changes the direction of a man's life to the narrow pathway. Romans 5.17 tells us about the grace. It says, For all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Let me ask you, do you find this information foolish and silly? Or would you be interested in knowing more about God's gift of forgiveness of sin? If you find this message foolish and silly, then this would indicate that Satan has blinded you. Are you aware of your inherited sin nature passed down through the generations in the DNA chain? In Romans 5 verse 12 it says, When Adam sinned, sin entered the entire human race. His sin spread death throughout all the world. So everything began to grow old and die for all sinned. We see the DNA chain in action here in the phrase, sin entered the entire human race. In the next sentence, we see sin's effect on the DNA chain. It caused everything to die because it says, for all sinned, 
indicating the sin nature was passed down to all generations. God has given the first man, Adam, the ability to make decisions on his own. When Adam chose to violate God's command of do not eat the fruit, the penalty for this action was death as recorded in Genesis 2.17. Now God's creation was going to die because it says in Hebrews 9 verse 27, And just as it is destined that men die only once, and after that comes judgment, you must face the fact that you're going to die. At the age of eight, no one thinks of dying. Yet at the age of 80, one is very much aware of that fact. God, however, foreknew Adam would fail to follow his command, and he had made a provision for his failure. In Romans 5, verses 18 through 20, we read, Yes, Adam's sin brought punishment to all, but Christ's righteousness makes man right with God so that they can live. Adam caused many to be sinners because he disobeyed God, and Christ caused many to be made acceptable to God because he obeyed. The Ten Commandments were given so that all could see the extent of their failure to obey God's laws. But the more we see our sinfulness, the more we see God's abounding grace forgiving us. In 1 John 1 verses 8 and 9 we read, If we say that we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and refusing to accept the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he can be depended on to forgive us and to cleanse us from every wrong. And it is perfectly proper for God to do this for us because Christ died to wash away our sins. In Romans 3, verses 21 through 24, We read, But now God has shown us a different way to heaven, not by being good enough and trying to keep his laws. Now God says he will accept and acquit us, declare us not guilty if we trust Jesus Christ to take away our sins, and we all can be saved in the same way by coming to Christ no matter who we are or what we have been like. Yes, all have sinned. All fall short of God's glorious ideal. Yet now God declares us not guilty of offending him if we trust in Jesus Christ, who in his kindness freely takes away our sins. Romans 3 verse 25 goes on to tell us, For God sent Christ Jesus to take the punishment for our sins and to end all God's anger against us. He used God's blood and our faith as the means of saving us from his wrath. In this way, he was being entirely fair, even though he did not punish those who sinned in former times for he was looking forward to the time when Christ would come and take away those sins. We read in John 3:16, For God loved the world so much that he gave his only Son, so that anyone who believed in him shall not perish but have eternal life. All who do what? believe in his Son, are part of the family of God. 
God is creating this new family to live in a new heaven and a new earth. In John 1, verses 12 and 13, we're told, But to all who receive him, he gave the right to become children of God. All they need to do was to trust him to save them. All those who believe this are reborn. Not a physical rebirth resulting from human passion or plan, but from the will of God. In John 3, verses 5 through 7, Jesus was telling Nicodemus about being reborn. It says, Jesus replied, What I am telling you so earnestly is this, Unless one is born of the water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Man can only reproduce human life but the Holy Spirit gives new life from heaven. So don't be surprised at my statement that you must be born again. Is God the Father drawing you to Jesus? Or does this knowledge sound foolish and silly? Will you accept or reject Jesus based on knowledge? or ignorance. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4. Satan, who is the god of this evil world, has made him blind, unable to see the glorious light of the gospel that is shining on him, or to understand the amazing message we preach about the glory of Christ, who is God. Remember, Satan blinds mankind in several ways. Because of man's sinful nature, he draws them to run after money, to seek power or pleasure. In this way, it makes God's good news appear to be of no value. Matthew 22, verse 14 says, Many are called, few are chosen. Those chosen are the ones who accept Jesus as Lord. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9 tells us about those who have been chosen. It says, Because of his kindness, you have been saved through trusting Christ. And even trusting is not of yourselves. It too is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good we have done, so none of us can take any credit for it. We see here that it is God who opens our eyes of understanding and gives us the ability to trust and have faith in Jesus and what he did. Question. Has God opened your eyes of understanding and removed your ignorance of who Jesus is and what he came to do? Have you ever asked Jesus to come into your heart and life? Do you hear Jesus knocking at your heart's door? Revelation 3.20 says, Look, I have been standing at the door, and I'm constantly knocking. If anyone hears me calling him and opens the door, I will come in and fellowship with him and he with me. Jesus has a gift for you if you open the door. If God has been drawing you to Jesus, then answer the knock and pray with me. Father God, I fall on my knees before you, Almighty God, crying out, O oh Lord, save me from my sins through the blood of Jesus on the cross at Calvary. I'm surrendering myself to Jesus and trusting in the gift of faith for what Jesus has done for me. Thank you, Jesus, for taking my sins to the cross so that I might have eternal life. Holy Spirit, 
Teach me God's ways that I might learn how to be a faithful servant. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed this prayer with me, then God has given you a new spirit and you've been born again, adopted into the family of God. Welcome to the family. In 2 Corinthians 15, verse 17, we find when someone becomes a Christian, he becomes a brand new person inside. He's not the same anymore. He has a new life. The Holy Spirit has given him a new spirit free of sin. Yes, he has been born again of the Spirit. Verses 18 and 19 go on to tell us about the new spirit that God has given you. It says, All these new things are from God, who brought us back to himself through what Christ Jesus did. And God has given us the privilege of urging everyone to come into his favor and be reconciled to him. For God was in Christ restoring the world to himself, no longer counting men's sins against them, but blotting them out. And this is the wonderful message he has given us to tell others. Because in Romans 10 verses 9 and 10 he says, For if you tell others with your own mouth that Jesus Christ is your Lord, and believe in your own heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in his heart that a man becomes right with God, and with his mouth he tells others of his faith, confirming his salvation. As part of the family of God, we're told in Ephesians 2.10, It is God himself who has made us what we are and given us new lives from Christ Jesus. And long ages ago, he planned that we should spend these lives in helping others. Question. As a member of God's family, what should your goal be? Answer. Help others to become successful in Christ. Well, our time is up, and it is for you to answer the question. How would you weigh your awareness of knowledge against your awareness of ignorance? Until next time, good day.